All right. So the last time uh, we were in a call with everybody together, uh, we went through all this information about thermochemistry and we worked through some problems um, where we discussed how much heat was released uh, if we considered the uh, enthalpy of formation. Uh, and we started kind of mentioning calorimetry. So let's do that a little bit more specifically now. So uh, strictly speaking, calorimetry is the science of measuring heat. Um, and you've probably heard of the term calorie before, uh, especially if you've been in um, a supermarket and you've seen on the back of the label, it will say how many calories are within a certain food. Uh, one of the ways that we measure that is with calorimetry. Um, basically, calorimetry is measuring the change in temperature when uh, a body, now by body we mean a, uh, a system uh, or surroundings, absorbs or discharges heat as energy. So a, um, a substance is going to respond to heat differently based off of just some intrinsic proper or some properties of the material itself. Uh, and we're going to call that specific thing the heat capacity. Uh, and we're going to define it as C. So heat capacity is a term that um, you may not know uh, mathematically what it means, but you know in a real world sense what it means. So mathematically, we're going to say that C is the heat absorbed divided by the increase in temperature. Um, the a way that you can uh, physic or a way that you've probably experienced. Um, specific, or I'm sorry, heat capacity has been, uh, if you've ever touched a, a log that's been out in the sun on a hot sunny day versus an aluminum chair that's been out in a hot sunny day. And if you know that, like, if you have a, an option, if you go to like a pool um, and between it sitting in a wooden chair and sitting in a metal chair, you typically go for the wooden one, just unless you really, really like that uh, feeling of being burned. And that's because that, that aluminum absorbs a lot of energy uh, compared to the wood. Um, and so the reason that is, is every way that we can discuss that is because of uh, heat capacity. So the two different materials have different heat capacities. So how much heat actually gets absorbed, how much energy in the form of heat gets absorbed by a material, um, and how much then it raises its temperature. A lot of times in chemistry, we're going to be using specific heat capacity. Um, now, the difference between specific heat capacity and heat capacity is uh, just the way that we're going to define it. And they've just got a little bit of nuance here. So a specific heat capacity is going to be the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. So heat capacity is how much energy is absorbed with respect to an increase in temperature. Specific heat, now we're saying energy and raise in temperature, but specifically one degree of temperature and specifically only one gram of material. So the definition here is a little bit more nuanced. Both of these definitions, though, get used in science uh, and thermochemistry fairly regularly. So you would use something like heat capacity in uh, a um, experiment uh, that's called bomb, bomb calorimetry. And so if you look at that constant volume uh, enthalpy change that I asked you to read about in your book, you'll see in a bomb calorimeter, a lot of times what you will use is heat capacity. Um, because you will have taken into consideration the mass and other things uh, elsewhere. But for our constant uh, pressure calorimetry, um, and for most of the problems that we are going to do in Chemistry 150, we're going to be using our specific heat capacity. So they both get used. You kind of have to keep track of uh, which one is the right one to use, and your units are going to be that key to help you figure out which one is which. Okay, so if we talk about the 
first law of thermodynamics, and I promise this is going to come into calorimetry here in a second. The first law of thermodynamics is telling us that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's just getting transferred from one place to another. So with calorimetry, we're specifically talking about uh, thermodynamics. And because the upstairs of the house is like using tons of water. Are you all able to hear that through the mic? Oh, good. Yeah, because it sounds like it's a just torrent of water falling down on me. Um, it's really great because we're here in a basement and all the piping is just right there. <sighs> it's so good. Anyways, um, first law of thermodynamics. The energy lost by the system is going to be equal to the energy gained by the surroundings or vice versa. So we could say the energy gained by the system is going to be equal to that lost by the surroundings. We're going to use that in calorimetry. So basically we can think, okay, if we can measure either the uh, change in energy in either the surroundings or in the system, we can figure out what's happening with the other one. Um, so the amount of heat is going to be equal to, um, well, I'm sorry. So if we can measure, if we can figure out a way to measuring the heat change in one of them, we can figure out the heat change in the other one. So if we can figure out how much heat change occurred in the surroundings, we could figure out by extension how much heat change occurred within our system. So let's define then the amount of heat to be equal to, um, Sorry, the water is just absolutely killing me. And I don't think there's going to be a way for me to stop that because it's shower time for the kids. There we go. Maybe I'll be able to focus a little bit better now. Maybe I won't be able to hear it as much. It's bad. If you all aren't getting deafened by that, uh, good on you. Okay. So uh, the amount of heat will be equal to the product of the mass of the solution times the temperature change times the specific heat of a substance. And so that leads us to this equation that we've got down here at the bottom, this Q equals, so heat equals S, sp our specific heat, times mass, the amount of stuff that we're actually uh, heating up or cooling off, times that change in temperature, that delta T. So the heat change is gonna, Q is gonna equal mass time, or I'm sorry, specific heat times mass times change in temperature. Wow, the water's done, so I can take those headphones off. All right. So um, if you've taken a look at your Chem 151 lab, if you're in Chem 151, um, the, la the thermochemistry lab that we're focusing on is a dissolution of a solid. And so we're measuring the energy change that's necessary for a uh, solid to dissolve. Um, is this an endothermic process or is this an exothermic process when this dissolving occurs? If we can measure the change in temperature of the water that the solid is dissolving into, and if we know exactly how much water there is, and if we know the specific heat, or yeah, the specific heat capacity of water, we could figure out Q, the amount of heat change in the water. The amount of heat change in the water is going to be equal to the amount of heat either released or gained by the system, the system being our chemicals. And so we can then figure out the exact amount of heat um, exchange happening between our system and our surroundings. What is a typical kind of uh, question that you might see for a specific heat capacity with respect to chemistry 150? And so this would be one of those kinds of problems here. So our specific, it's telling us uh, the specific, specific heat capacity of silver is 0 0.24 uh, joules per degree Celsius times gram. Calculate the energy required to raise the temperature of 150 grams, that should be 150 grams of silver, from 273 Kelvin to 298 Kelvin. 
So we're going to go to the whiteboard here to answer this problem. All right. So if we go here now, oops, you know, it would be helpful as if we actually go to the whiteboard. So if we write out our equation, Q equals S times M times delta T. Our delta T is going to be set up like our other deltas that we have talked about in this chapter. So it's going to be temperature final minus temperature initial. This will tell us sometimes that we're going to have a negative delta T value. That negative is important because that negative is going to give us an indication for which direction the energy change is occurring with respect to heat. Will the heat be a negative value or will it be a positive value? Whether it's a negative or a positive value lets us know do we have an endothermic process or do we have an exothermic process. So because this is a Q equals uh, S M delta T, sometimes you're going to uh, see it uh, M C. Now this C is a lowercase C. So M C delta T. Both those equations are going to tell you the same thing. The S and the C get used interchangeably. But this is going to be specifically a lower KC. An upper KC is going to be heat capacity. Upper KC, so C does not equal C. Right? The one on the right is your heat capacity, the one on the left is your specific heat. We can now just start plugging and chugging numbers into this equation. So with our M, we go to our problem and then we've got 150 grams of silver. Tells us our specific heat capacity is going to be 0 0.24 joules over degrees C times grams. And now here for delta T, this is where we're going to try to think a little smarter than the average bear. For delta T, it's giving it to us in Kelvin. And if you look at the value there, it's saying degrees Celsius. Well, honest to goodness, because the difference in degrees between Kel a change in one degree Kelvin and a change in one degree degree Celsius is the exact same, we can keep the both of these numbers as Kelvin. We don't have to convert them over to Celsius. In fact, depending, um, you might get yourself confused if you're using Celsius here because if you have a negative Celsius temperature, you might there, there's more uh, opportunities for mistakes to be using Celsius. You're going to see me use Kelvin most of the time here when we do these changes in temperature because the Kelvin, for me anyways, is easier to work with and I'm going to ha I have fewer mistakes when I use that. So our final temperature from the way that it's being read is that 298 Kelvin. And the initial is going to be that 273. Kelvin. This is going to be equal to the heat of our, or I'm sorry, this is going to be uh, equal to the energy required to change the temperature like the question asked us. And naturally, I've misplaced my calculator, so I'm going to go grab that. And I'm back. All right. So we start plugging and chugging things in, 150 times, well, let's make sure that the units cancel. So we've got grams of silver in the numerator, and we have grams in the denominator, so that's going to get canceled. Over here on the uh, far right of the equation, the Kelvin won't, strictly speaking, cancel the degree Celsius, except for the fact, like I said, that one degree Celsius 
is going to be the same amount of change as one Kelvin change. So the Kelvin and the Celsius will cancel. It'll be okay, promise. So, and if you don't believe me, feel free to change it to Celsius to make it work. You should end up with the same answer. So that 150 times 0.24 times, and if depending on your calculator, um, you're either going to do the subtraction first and then you're going to multiply everything out or you're going to use parentheses or brackets or something like that so that you let your calculator remember, hey, I need to do the subtraction before I do all the rest of this. Otherwise, it's going to try to multiply the first three numbers and then subtract the last number. And I ended up with a number of... 900 and hopefully you did too the what are the units going to be here joules joules yeah it's literally the only thing we got left everything else got canceled so what does the fact that that is a positive 900 joules tell us So here, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the 900 joules? Like, what, what is the, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. We can look at the words of the problem and we can say, okay, it's telling us the energy required to raise the temperature. If we're raising the temperature, then we're having to put energy into our system, the system being the silver. So this would be an endothermic process. So we can rationalize that this is an endothermic process just by looking at the words from the problem. We could also look at the 900 and say, oh, that's a positive. So the heat here is a positive value. I know heat, positive heat values with respect to systems mean that this is an endothermic process. So you have two chances here to double to uh, figure out, hey, this is an endothermic process. You also have, if you want to think about it the other way, thermic, yeah, sure. You can say, all right, the words tell me it's an endothermic process. My number tells me it's an endothermic process. Everything's cool. If you ended up with a negative 900 here and you were looking at the words of the problem and saying, well, it should be endothermic, but my number is giving me an exothermic number. Those two don't match up. What's going on? So it's a nice little way to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Okay. So on the spicy scale, this is going to be a green pepper. Um, on the discussion packet, we have a uh, spicier calorimetry problem. Um, and I do suggest that you go through that one and we'll be going through it in discussion as well. Uh, more or less, the trick on more complicated problems would be something along the lines of, cool, you've defined this Q here as Q of your system. What you can remember from this previous slide is that Q of your system is going to need to equal negative Q of your surroundings. Don't forget to put that negative sign. It doesn't actually matter if it ends up on the surrounding side or the system side. You just need one of those to be negative. You need one side of the equation to be negative. So what this is telling you if you plug this equation that we just wrote out with the information up above is that our surroundings need to lose, lose 900, it's not a kilojoule, joules of energy. Well, how are they going to figure, how are they going to lose that much energy? Well, we could be burning something. 
right? We could be applying heat uh, radiatively. There's a number of different ways that we could, we could be providing energy. Um, but the oftentimes what you're going to see is um, it needing to be set up in MC delta T format. Um, so you end up with your Q of your surroundings being discovered by MC delta T as well. So you could possibly end up with, if we do a little bit of plugging and chugging in here, you can end up with a long equation of a negative mass of your surroundings times the specific heat of your surroundings times delta T of your surroundings equals mass of your system times the specific heat of your system times delta T of your system. And all of that's completely valid and legal because we're just doing plugging and chugging. We're just rearranging mathematical equations. So that's how, that is one way we can make calorimetry a bit more of a spicy question. Any questions about calorimetry at this point? Okie doke. Um, so uh, maybe we'll finish up calorimetry here and maybe we'll, we're, we'll see how we're feeling here after we get through this slide. Um, one thing about calorimetry is that the heat of reaction, as we've defined it on Friday, I believe, uh, it's going to be an extensive property. Um, and extensive properties, uh, if you remember back to chapter two, means that they're going to depend upon the amount of substance that we have. So something like density is an intensive property. It doesn't matter if you've got one ton or one gram of silver, it's always going to have the same density. However, the heat of reaction uh, is going to depend upon how much substance that you actually have. Where do you find these specific heats? Well, your book is going to have tables full of the specific heat values for all different kinds of materials. Um, there's tons of them. One that one thing that I would point out to you is that um, one thing I'd point out to you is those specific heats um, are phase dependent. So if you're looking at something like water, make sure if the question is asking you about liquid water, you use the specific heat for liquid water, not for gaseous or solid water because they are wildly different. Um, make sure you are using the proper phase of the material. Water is really the one that comes to mind um, in problems where that becomes an issue. Okay. Um, 